moving on from what I've said in the previous video, one thing I don't like is when people make critical opinions or judgments that attempt to take on an economic role, but they usually come off as misinformed. And usually they are misinformed, they don't actually touch up on the subject, they don't actually put in research to these economic opinions. And you can't do that. For example, this is one thing I have a problem with Rap Critic a lot, even though I love his videos. He'll call a rapper someone that just comes came out of the blue, never saw him, and he would just say that he's a passing fad, that he's this other artist 7.4, he's just a generic clone. And then when I look into this rapper, I think it was Kid Inc. Kid Inc. had history. That guy, he was in that Molly Cyrus song that I thought was really funny. I think he got some heat because of that. One thing I used to do in 2010, so I'm guilty of this too, is calling things passing fads. For example, black people memes. I used to think that niggas be like, wouldn't last three months. No, I thought that it was going to have three months tops, and then it was going to fade into obscurity. Obviously, that wasn't what happened. When it came into the scene around September, we were seeing a bunch of basic mid-tier niggas be like shit. And now that it's the summer of 2014, that still exists. I also thought that Instagram would be a passing fad. And I think Instagram is doing pretty well for itself. I thought that Facebook made a bad investment spending all that money to get Instagram, which I still hold on to that opinion. But looking back, no, I'd say that it was, well, they put too much money into that as usual. Monopolies like engaging in that kind of activity. Kill a competition, even if it's absurd to do it in a certain way. Just do it. Just kill all the competition. Instagram it has stayed. I thought it would die off in the summer, or at least in the winter of 2012. Again, we're in the summer of 2014, and Instagram is still really active. It's it's on point. A lot of guys that thought it would die off. A lot of artists that thought it would die off, and. Drake was one of them, and Drake is still here. So you actually have to put in real research to make an economic critique. What I mean by economics is the end result. I'm borrowing off of that dumb Austrian definition. I'm, I'm going to call it dumb because I'm a condescending guy. Not because it's actually dumb. That economics is only concerned with the end goal of something. And people will think that, and I think that it's just easy to look at anything call it a passing fad. That it will come to pass. And keep in mind, while I was seeing all of these things, I was a firm believer in 3D printing and other scientific advancements, which I'm a lot more fishy on. And I was a firm believer in the happening. So I thought Drake wouldn't last and that the happening would happen around the time he'd fall off. So 
once streak falls off, well, the happening starts because they're going to happen at a similar time. Remember a lot of people here? I'm looking at you, Eric Orwall. You guys would say stuff like, uh, 2016, that's when financial collapse sets in motion. And you, you can already tell me right now, uh, that's not really looking as sound as it did maybe in 2012 or late 2011. I'll even early 2013. Not to say that our economy is peaches and cream, but that doomsday clock seems kind of suspicious. But calling things passing fads, calling things trends without a future, when you're doing that as a critic, I think you're engaging in your job a little bit, engaging in your role a little bit, but some people spend too much time as critics engaged in that activity that if they're a reviewer, they're not, they're neglecting their other roles that they oftentimes are better at doing, like uh, convincing us, should we spend money on this? Should we spend time giving this a chance? That kind of argument, that sales, marketarian, I'd say a more logical role that they could be playing. And they neglect it for this pseudo wannabe economic role, which really fails most of the time. Taught in the Shadows, going back to my session with Nostalgia Critic. I love Taught in the Shadows since 2010, the summer of 2010. I said 2020 for some reason. I got the Tweety voice for no apparent reason. He really loved Katy Perry and Rihanna's songs. He didn't understand why. He loved certain Black Eyed Peas songs and he felt that he would like them for a long time. And yet, four years later, hell, oh, maybe even five or three years later, he tells us he doesn't feel this anymore and that all the value he had for these guilty pleasures are gone and with a lot of his indie critiques, his indie, well, what's considered indie rock nowadays, his guilty pleasures, later on he realizes, hey, these are kind of boring too. So we find out that his opinions gradually become... I'd say downgraded or they lose legitimacy. They become illegitimates. And that's kind of why I like his old school reviews for or his videos where he asks what happened to them, where are they not now in terms of one hit wonders from the 80s and 70s. And even in the 90s and early 2000s, like Alien Ant Farm and their cover of Smooth Criminal by Michael Jackson. Because he's talking about something that's old, that you can play the role of the Monday morning quarterback. And when he ga gauges in that kind of analysis, he's on point. Even though I hate the fact that he's so hard on new metal. I mean, I'm not as big as new metal as I was in 2012 or 2013. But I'm not as adamantly against it as I was in 09, 2010, 2011. Hell, like any other... 12 year old. I was big into new metal in 2012 and 20. I mean, uh, 2007, 2008. So, when he reviews current songs, 
it's easy for him to really come off as someone that's going to bite his tongue in the future. Oftentimes in half a year or so, semi-annually. But what else can you expect? Muse Productions. Mark Muse does this a lot too. And not just with music, when he's reviewing chart songs or full-on albums. But also when he does his weekly Raw review. He'll make mistakes there too. He'll form an opinion and then later on go on to regret it. And sometimes he'll admit to this. Usually he won't. Me personally, I like Mark Muse. He's liked some of my stuff and f followed me on Tumblr back when I had a Tumblr. Keep in mind, I deleted that shit last month and I don't regret it now. I don't think I ever will, but even if I did, I can always make another one. So he's a cool guy, but his reviews don't have the legitimacy that maybe a Spoonie would. And I know I love talking about Spoonie like he's the greatest thing since sliced bread, but even when I don't agree with everything he says, and I'll go on into further detail in about a week or so. That guy, when he says something, he rarely goes on to bite his own tongue. One of these is Final Fantasy VIII. He went on to say, okay, it's not really that good. I didn't like it when it came out. I still don't like it. But it's gotten so bad that this doesn't deserve as much critique as I gave it. But that's as far as he ever got. Anyways, this is Mr. Wonka 7. I'm going to upload both of these videos much later. And suck my dick. Have a good late morning. It's 10.56 a.m. for me. Yeah. Noon, I guess.